Okay, so uh, welcome to our next lecture on <clears throat> pneumatology. Um, have more of a brief lecture uh, this time. Um, and this, uh, if I'm, if I look at the syllabus correctly, this is our, this will be my last lecture, um, barring some uh, lecture to get you guys ready for um, the final exam, or maybe we do a Zoom or something to to make sure that you're on the right the right track with your paper. Um, but um, so what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to discuss the terminology that uh, that appears in the Bible, um, baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so the reason we're doing this, and we've alluded to this a few times uh, throughout the semester, but the the advent of sorry my notes are covering the the uh, the screen so the, so the advent of the the modern Pentecostal movement has really changed a lot of the language um, changed a lot of the emphasis of of some of the things you talk about uh, when you discuss um, Christian pneumatology and so so because Pentecostalism is um, the largest segment of Protestant Christianity. It's really arguably the most aggressive growth movement in Christianity since uh, the first or second century. I mean, there were zero, zero Pentecostals at, you know, in 1906 and then 400 million by the end of the, the 20th century. So that's, that's a pretty aggressive growth. You don't see the growth as much uh, in the United States, even though the Pentecostal movement started in the United States. But um, in Asia, in Africa, in South America, um, that's where most of the, the growth of Christianity as a global movement um, is coming. And it's coming through Pentecostal movements and denominations. So um, because it's such a tremendous movement, in terms of numbers uh, in Christianity, um, we need to speak to some of the, the, the language that Pentecostals use. And so uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit is something that Pentecostals affirm. And so we're going to talk about that in this lecture um, and kind of make sure that everybody understands uh, when that terminology is used, what is meant by it. So terminology used to define um, or describe related to baptism or baptizing the spirit appears roughly 40 or so times in the New Testament. And here are some specific references in the Bible to give you an idea of, of, of that terminology. So first, let's go to Isaiah 44, 33, and I'm just going to read uh, from my notes here. This is a prophecy about spirit baptism. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. So that's from Isaiah 44, 3. John the Baptist, this is probably the most um, common um, reference that you'll see to the term baptize or baptism in the Holy Spirit. Um, John the Baptist references the Messiah that is to come, uh, will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. Uh, that appears um, uh, Mark 3.11, Mark 1.8, Luke 3.16, and John 1.33. So when you move to Acts, this is very important to understanding uh, what the term means. So Acts 1, 2 through 5 records the words of Jesus. And here's, I'm just going to read Acts 1, 2 through 5. Jesus, uh, so, so Luke's writing. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his many sufferings by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. 
And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So this is the clearest indication in the Bible that what John the Baptist was talking about and what Jesus is talking about here would take place on the day of Pentecost, which is recorded in Acts chapter 2. I just don't think you can, I don't think you can deny that. And then when you get to Acts 11, you have the um, that discourse on uh, Peter at Cornelius' house. And in Acts chapter 11, uh, Peter is retelling what happened at Cornelius' house. And he equates the gift of tongues, which he saw at Cornelius' house, that he witnessed with Jesus' words in Acts 1, 2 through 5. So it's important to understand that Jesus defined the term, baptized with the Holy Spirit. He defined it. When he connected the events that Luke would record in Acts chapter 2. So in my opinion, it's a it's a pretty done deal as far as I can tell. There's I just don't think there's any legitimate way that the term baptized in the Holy Spirit can mean water baptism or even the reception of the Spirit at conversion. Uh, those in the upper room, you know, by all accounts, had already confessed with their mouth and believed in their heart that Jesus was Lord. Um, and so the New, Te New Testament use of baptism in the Holy Spirit, um, in my opinion, is definitively tied to the outward manifestation that accompanied the reception of the Spirit as an endowment of power. So biblically, the, the term baptism in the Holy Spirit, as used by John and, and by Jesus, and Jesus himself pointing to an event not many days from now, right? Before he ascends, he says, not many days from now that this event, this baptism with the Holy Spirit is going to happen not many days from now. Um, that is a clear sign that, that Jesus is referring to what's about to happen in Acts chapter 2, where the believers essentially are immersed in the paraclete, and this immersion is signaled by these outward manifestations of 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 the, the of being immersed in the spirit speaking in tongues in acts chapter 2 and so i think biblically that's the case i just don't think you can i don't think you can argue with that the challenge comes is does that mean that that is and we're going to we're going to toy with these questions i don't know that we'll definitively answer them I just want to make sure that you're aware of some of the, the, the views. But the real question for Pentecostals is whether or not speaking in tongues is the only proof of baptism in the Holy Spirit. But as far as the Bible is concerned, I just don't think there's any question that when you see the, the phrase baptism in the Holy Spirit, that is definitively referring to what happened um, both in Acts chapter 2 and what happened uh, when Peter was at Cornelius' house. So let's move past the New Testament. Let's move into uh, the early church. Um, how did the early church interpret baptism in the Holy Spirit? So after the apostles died, the church began to develop traditions regarding how they express the sacraments of baptism and communion. And so a, a person that that receives Jesus, this is in the you know second century, third century, a person that receives Jesus is called a catechumen. It's a this is a new Christian. And so in most of your churches, uh, what would happen was these new believers um, would be segregated into another area of the building, whether they're meeting in a home church or um, we know that some church buildings were being built by the second century 
not many, most were still house churches. And so that these catechumens would spend a, roughly a year uh, learning doctrine, having their lives examined. And at the end of that year, uh, they would be moved forward for baptism and communion. And so uh, baptism was typically in another part of the building. Um, the, the catechumen would be um, it completely immersed uh, by water. Uh, they would be baptized and then they would receive their first communion. So according to early church writers, and not just one or two, Tertullian, Origen, Hilary of Partiers, Cyril of Jerusalem, Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nazianzus, and John Chrysostom all write about these events at the New Believer Baptism where the, the believer would come out of the water and would begin to speak in other tongues and prophesy. Remember, the first church, the early church was a charismatic community where the gifts of the Spirit were in operation and it was normative, right? That's why Montanism wasn't such a big deal. Only that Montanism had the first person prophecy. That was really the problem with Montanism. But the early church was a charismatic community. And so these catechumens, it was not unusual for them to come out of the water and be, uh, be expressing these outward signs, this speaking in tongues. And so as a result of this event that was happening throughout Christendom, the church eventually, as it became less charismatic, so eventually the church became less charismatic, meaning that those, those, those outward manifestations of the Spirit, those gifts of grace given by the Spirit, uh, tongues and prophecy and healing and those things, became less apparent. But even as those things became less apparent, the church still retained the idea that the Holy Spirit was given at baptism because of these numerous accounts of, I would even say this normative account, according to all these early church fathers, these, this normative account of, of speaking in tongues at baptism. And so the church developed this idea that the Holy Spirit was given at baptism. So then when the charismatic gifts faded and there was no more speaking in tongues, the church still retained that idea that the spirit was given at baptism. And this is generally the doctrine of the Christian church from the, we'll say the fifth or sixth century until really the 20th century, the end of the 19th, uh, in 1996 is when you had the Shearer schoolhouse revival. Um, into the 20th century, 1906, with the Azusa Street Revival. So this, this idea that the Holy Spirit was given at baptism with no accompanying signs, like speaking in tongues, really was the prevailing um, theology around baptism in the Holy Spirit until the Pentecostal movement. And um, so now... What you have in the 20th century is you have quite a bit of pushback from traditional Protestant and even evangelical churches against the Pentecostal experience. So, so these churches, even though you had the Pentecostal revival going on, along with Roman Catholic and Eastern, uh, Eastern Christians, um, continued to believe that the Spirit was given at baptism in the same way that it descended on Jesus at his baptism, right? That's the, the other biblical evidence for that. Well, now that Pentecostalism is such a large segment of the Christian community, you really don't see much pushback from um, Protestant and evangelicals um, regarding whether or not speaking in tongues is evidence of spirit baptism, but what you do get pushback on is is um, some of these non-Pentecostal uh, scholars want to focus on defining speaking in tongues by different terminology. They're not willing to give that terminology to Pentecostals. So um, there's still quite a bit of debate raging in academia about whether or not baptism in the spirit, um, whether Pentecostals are right about it or not. 
um, because of these traditions that developed through the Christian Christian church. And so that debate hasn't been settled. I will say that generally speaking, I think that Pentecostals are winning that debate because you don't see the debate as much anymore. But what you, what you have now is you don't have as much debate between Pentecostals and non-Pentecostals about whether or not uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit is what Pentecostals say it is. As much as now you have a debate among Pentecostals about whether or not speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of spirit baptism. And let's see what I mean by that. So nearly every traditional sort of um, legacy, if you will, uh, Pentecostal denomination defines speaking in tongues as the initial evidence of spirit baptism, meaning that spirit baptism is identified by speaking in tongues. And most every, most every Pentecostal denomination that can trace its roots back to either the Shearer Schoolhouse Revival in 1896 or the Azusa Street Revival in 1906 has some form of that verbiage in their doctrinal statements. But here's the problem. Um, a few years ago, Christianity, I, think it was, I believe it was Christianity Today, um, reported that um, right around 50% of all Pentecostals do not and have not ever spoken in tongues. So there's a lot of questions about, about that. You know, can you call yourself a Pentecostal if you've never, speaking in to never spoken in tongues? Um, is a Pentecostal church really a Pentecostal church if less than half of its people speak in tongues? Um, so... So, so a large segment of people that attend Pentecostal churches either have never or rarely speak in tongues, um, but they do testify to possessing other spiritual gifts. Some of those things that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 12, um, prophecy, interpretation of tongues, healing, discernments of, uh, discernment of spirits, wisdom. So there is this growing belief that um, tongues are one sign of spirit baptism, but not the only sign. Now there is, obviously that is, that is a can of worms, right? Um, because you, you have to ask, so first of all, is that the Pentecost, is that the Pentecostal church adapting their doctrine to to the practical reality or is it the Pentecostal church um, redefining their doctrine of spirit baptism based on um, based on the movement of the spirit meaning that they weren't wrong in the beginning um, but it looks like the spirit is moving in different ways. It's just, it's, it's a, it's a huge, it's a, it's a huge issue um, in the, the Pentecostal church. Um, but as, as much as this debate really rages, um, most of these legacy Pentecostal churches uh, have not updated their uh, official doctrinal statements and they still hold to the notion that spirit baptism is identified by speaking in tongues, but it is a debate that's raging in Pentecostalism. Um, I think what you, I think what you are seeing is um, at the local level, the pastors that, that are, that are overseeing the services where these spiritual gifts are being exercised um, are really pushing the notion that spirit baptism may mean more than just speaking in tongues. And I think you, you have some of the upper echelon academics that are not willing to let that go because 
spirit baptism, I'll go back to my first statements, spirit baptism, according to the New Testament, is very specifically tied to the events at um, on the day of Pentecost in the upper room. It, I just don't think you can deny that. And so I do think that scholars are less willing to say that it's anything but what was observed on the day of Pentecost, which is speaking in tongues. For goodness sakes, the movement is called the Pentecostal movement based on its identification with what happened on the day of Pentecost, right? So um, it's important to understand the perspective of modern Pentecostals um, because speaking in tongues is one of the five pillars. Like you, when you think about the, the belief system of Pentecostals, what you find is you find that there are essentially five pillars of Pentecostal theology. Um, one is salvation by grace alone through faith alone. That is a that is a solid Protestant affirmation. Um, sanctification was a work of grace to produce holiness. Now that's I don't spend a lot of time on that, but um, um, and you may not know this. This may surprise you, but when you think about the two primary expressions of Protestant doctrine. You have uh, you have John Calvin and you have, and I'm going to be reformers, the reformed Protestant, not just Protestant, but like I, I'm, I'm excluding like Episcopal here, that, that sort of thing, because that's really Anglican. So let's, you know, excluding Lutheranism, I'm talking about really evangelical, this, this reformed, um, way of thinking. So you have two expressions of, of theological traditions. You have Calvinism and you have uh, Wesleyanism, which is um, informed by um, Arminianism to a large extent. So because of the Pentecostal outpouring and the revival, Wesleyanism is far and away the predominant expression of Protestant theology. And Calvinism is, generally speaking, a, a minority view. Now, it's not a minority view in America. Most Calvinists live in the United States or in Western Europe. Um, and you have to be careful. You can't tell Calvinists that their beliefs are a minority expression because they can't imagine someone not being a Calvinist. But this this second pillar of Pentecostalism, this salvation or this sanctification um, was a work of grace to produce holiness. That is, that is about as Wesleyan as you can possibly get. So the third pillar is spirit baptism evidenced by speaking in tongues. It's a pillar, right? I want you to think about the, the, what I'm saying. It's, it's a foundational belief of the modern Pentecostal movement that spirit baptism is evidenced by speaking in tongues. And so you just now really are starting to see a debate about, is it really? And so we're, we're just going to have to let Pentecostals work that out themselves. The other two pillars are divine healing and the imminent return of Jesus. So this, the importance of speaking in tongues for Pentecostals really can't be underestimated. It is part of the ethos of the Pentecostal community. Um, it's what gives them their primary identity. And there is an ongoing discussion about uh, among Pentecostal theologians um, about whether or not um, the, the doctrine needs to be updated. And so we obviously can't um, definitively speak to that here um, because even if, even if there are scholars within Pentecostal denominations that think um, that that prophecy or interpretation of tongues or some of these other gifts can be signs of spirit baptism. Um, the fact remains that these, do, these denominations have not changed their official doctrinal statement. And until those official, until those official, doctrinal statements change. I don't think that 
really there's been any change. You just have opinion. And so kind of to just conclude to wrap this up um, and let you get back to your life um, regarding spirit baptism, baptism in the spirit. I think it's clear from the New Testament use of the term that baptism in the Holy Spirit refers to what happened in Acts chapter 2. That's the only acceptable understanding from a biblical perspective. As the church became less charismatic, the idea of spirit baptism and water baptism kind of were blended um, to mean that um, the spirit was imparted at baptism. And um, currently there's a dialogue among Pentecostal scholars about whether or not um, they're willing to hold on to that pillar, which is that uh, speaking in tongues is evidence or whether they're willing to um say that some of those other gifts that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 12 can be um, evidences as well. So not a very long lecture uh, today, but I wanted to make sure that we at least touched on this uh, because Pentecostalism is such a, such a dominant expression in global Christianity. Um, I hope that uh, this was helpful. I hope that it was helpful in helping you understand at least um, that perspective Um and for all you Elam students, uh, please remember, send me an email or text or call me if you have any questions. And uh, thanks for showing up to the lecture.